Welcome to the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center's webinar series. This webinar is entitled Health Workforce Needs Part 2, Healthcare Jobs, Training, and Career Paths. And it was presented by Bianca Frogner, Aaron Freyer, and Susan Chapman, and with special guest moderator Cleese Erickson on November 13th, 2017. All right, thank you, David. Um, welcome everyone to the second in a two-part series featuring the work of the Health Workforce Research Centers that have been funded by HRSA. We had an earlier call a couple weeks ago that focused on the workforce to support value-based care. And today we're gonna to focus, as, you, as you're aware, on healthcare jobs, training, and career pathways. And I'm excited to have three presenters today um, that are gonna be sharing their collective work from the center findings. And before we do that, I'm gonna turn it over briefly to Ed Salzberg, who was the head of the Center for Workforce Studies at HRSA when, um, when these centers were initially funded. And he's gonna provide some brief introductory remarks. Good afternoon, this is Ed Salzberg. I'm happy to introduce the second of our two-part webinar on the health workforce, sponsored by the Health Workforce Technical Assistance Center at the University of Albany. The health workforce is critical to our care delivery system. The successes and failures of our delivery system rest in part with the adequacy of the supply and skills of our health workforce. HRSA, the Federal Health Resources and Services Administration, over the last several years has supported six health workforce research centers and one technical assistance center in order to provide better and more accurate and more up-to-date information and data on the health workforce. In the rapidly changing healthcare delivery system, a better understanding of the health workforce and our future needs is critical to the effort to plan for the future and to have to try and assure an adequate workforce in the future. The goal of the health workforce planning is really to better align health professions, education, and training with the needs of the nation and the communities. To do that, you need to understand what those needs are, and you have to have tools in order to modify or adjust the production of health professionals so it is consistent with your projected future needs. Thank you, Ed. It was great to have that introduction. And now we'll get started with our um, first of our presenters. But today we're gonna to hear first from Bianca Frogner, who's the director of the Health Workforce Research Center at the University of Washington. And she's gonna be talking today primarily about um, trends in allied health and low skilled workforce. Hi, my name is Bianca Frogner. I'm the director of the University of Washington Center for Health Workforce Studies. Today I'm going to talk about the health workforce and the needs in this time of transformation. I'll be talking about who works in healthcare, a little bit about why we care, their career pathways, and touch on professional development. This work that I'll be presenting is conducted by a big team here at University of Washington at CHOOSE, but very closely aligned with work done by Sue Skillman, the Deputy Director of CHOOSE. So many of you are probably aware that healthcare has been growing fairly rapidly in terms of both costs and jobs. Healthcare is one of the largest employers, employing about 11% of all workers. Uh, that is about 16 million people who work in hospitals, ambulatory care, and long-term care. Healthcare has been one of the largest contributors to new job growth, accounting for about 16% of all new jobs. Many people are coming from retail services, food services, education, and other professional services. As you see here up on the slide, I'm presenting uh, the 10 fastest joint growing jobs projected over the next 10 years. And what I circled here are the jobs that tend to be related, especially to healthcare, but a couple you'll see are not circled here. It's the nurse practitioners and physical therapists. But what I'm trying to point out here is that among the 10 fastest growing jobs, many of them are at the aid or assistant uh, level. So really it's the low skilled jobs that are contributing to this fast growth. In general, we're expecting to see about a growth of three to four million new jobs over the next decade coming from healthcare. About half of those are 
are being driven by the Affordable Care Act, or at least that's what the earlier projections are predicting. And jobs that are not coming from the ACA, many of them are driven by job demand from the long-term care sector as exemplified by the types of jobs listed here on this slide, which include home health aides, physical therapy aides and assistants, and occupational uh, therapy aides and assistants. I'm going to turn to talk a little bit about who actually works in healthcare and what do they look like to give you a sense of a little bit more of a flavor of the healthcare workforce. So, healthcare is a fairly diverse workforce where the racial and ethnic mix looks fairly similar to the general population with slightly higher representation from African Americans, but slightly lower representation from Hispanics. But over time, we're seeing a growing diversity, both racially and ethnically, uh, in our healthcare workforce. Here I show just a snippet of work that we did for the Health Resources and Services Administration to take a careful look at in what jobs people of different race and ethnicity are taking on over time and areas where we're seeing a decline of individuals. And I just picked two of our race and ethnicity groupings from our, one of our recent reports because it's worth noting a, a couple things that's happening um, among our minority populations. Among African Americans, you see that there has been a growth of African Americans in some therapy jobs and technician jobs. Massage therapist is one of those fairly low-skilled jobs where we're seeing uh, quite a bit of growth, but you do have some more jobs that might require a post-secondary education or slightly higher, uh, and seeing an increase of African Americans in these somewhat skilled jobs. But you do see a decline of African Americans in somewhat more highly skilled jobs, such as physician assistants. Among Hispanics, of interest to note is that we're seeing an increase of Hispanics taking on these fairly low-skilled jobs, such as medical assistants, dental assistants, and you see a decline of Hispanics in some of those more mid-level skilled jobs, such as therapy uh, occupations of radiation, in radiation and recreational therapy. Immigrants also play an important role in our healthcare sector. Immigrants are about 16% of the healthcare workforce. We tend to see a concentration of immigrants in long-term care settings, in particular home health occupations. Here on this slide, we did a recent report breaking out immigrants who are naturalized citizens, so they were born um, outside of the U.S. but are now U.S. citizens, and then non-citizens. The people born outside the U.S. currently hold their immigrant status or citizenship status at another, in another country. And it's worth noting that here on this slide, in which jobs we tend to see a high number of naturalized uh, citizens and non-citizens or, or immigrants. Among our naturalized citizens, we tend to see among, for example, registered nurses, the top bar there, that about 20% of registered nurses are naturalized citizens. We tend to see naturalized citizens in a slightly more skilled job. On the other hand, our non-citizens, where we tend to see a higher concentration of them, are in our lowest skilled jobs, such as nursing, psychiatric, and home health aides, and personal slash home care aides. So these are the jobs really in the long-term care sector. When it comes to gender distribution, we looked at across a wide range of jobs that were available to us in our public data set that we were using. Um, in this case, it's the American Community Survey. And we tried to see where we set, tend to see a higher representation of males versus females. And generally, we saw that the trend that females tended to be in jobs which tended to be of lower skill requirements to enter into the job, such as dental assistants, 
we have here at the top of the list here, occupations such as massage therapists, personal and home care aides, occupational therapists, aides and assistants. Where you see, tend to see a higher concentration of males, tend to be in the higher skilled occupations such as physicians and surgeons, dentists, chiropractors, and podiatrists. We took a specific look at veterans in healthcare jobs just to have a sense of where we might see veterans and what their demographics might look like relative to our non-veteran population. And in general, we saw that there was a higher percentage of men, they were veterans, and we saw the same distribution as before where men tended to be in more higher skilled jobs. Now this was a real quick look at who works in healthcare and where we tend to see job growth. And what we like to point out in summary is that there's a growth of jobs really occurring among the low skilled jobs, many of which are concentrated in long-term care. The health workforce is female dominant with similar racial and ethnic and immigrant mix to the rest of the workforce with a heavy concentration of racial and ethnic minorities and immigrants in low skilled jobs. So what our concern is and worth further discussion is whether this is good for the individuals in these healthcare jobs, whether there's a career oppor ladder opportunity in the future or not, who is it uh, there for? And because some things that we did not point out is that many of these low skilled jobs experience high levels of poverty, they rely heavily on state and federal assistance programs, and they have high levels of unemployment if they lose their job. And in, in an era when healthcare is changing rapidly on a day-to-day -day basis, we need to start thinking about who is filling these jobs and what is their future in this industry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bianca. It's kind of exciting to hear some of these, the use of this, these data sources to shine a light on these workforce issues that sometimes haven't received the amount of attention that I think they deserve. Oh, I forgot to mention before um, Bianca's presentation, if anyone has any clarifying questions, please feel free to type those in the chat and direct them to all panelists so that we can all see them. But now, um, in the interim, feel free to go ahead and chat now, and I can we can access them at the end. We'll have time for more group conversation. But we will take one clarifying question between presentations following each session, if if needed. But next, we're going to turn to a presentation by Erin Freyer, from director of the Carolina Health Workforce Research Center, and she's going to be talking about some of the work that she's been doing, look at graduate medical education and um, how states are responding and what some of their needs are that she's been identifying as part of her research. Erin? This is Erin Freyer from the Carolina Health Workforce Research Center. And today I'm going to talk about one area of research that our center is engaged in, and that is developing a better understanding of graduate medical education. Our center really believes that through better data and research, we will have better policy. So I'm gonna talk about those projects today. We basically have undertaken six projects, and I'm gonna talk about three of our projects that we've already completed, listed there, and then three more projects that are in progress. And all of these projects, as I mentioned, are really aimed at different policymakers who I'll discuss to help them really have the data that they need for all sorts of different decisions that they're making in terms of GME investment. So let's start with the first study. The first study is a study on really trying to say, okay, acknowledging by the work done by Fitzhugh Mullen and, and others that there's really a maldistribution of dollars that are invested in graduate medical education across the country. Some areas have a lot, other areas do not. And so we actually used data from a physician projection model and said, okay, what if we use workforce data about where there are shortages, which specialties, which states have shortages, and we use the projection model to give us those data, and then we said, let's target GME expansions in those states. Where would we expand? And those findings suggest that we would expand GME in states with poor health outcomes and, and large growing populations, aging populations, no surprise Florida there, and then those places that have historically had 
less graduate medical education training dollars, fewer graduate medical education training dollars, and that would be out west, Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, Alaska, and Nevada. And we, so those were the states that, that the model said you would need to send um, graduate medical education dollars to. But we also looked at the specialties, and some of those specialties were ones that you'd expect in primary care, what we call the first certificate specialties in primary care, internal medicine, family medicine, general pediatrics. But cardiology as well received a large number of slots, and this is no surprise due to the aging population with a high incidence of cardiovascular disease. And one of the really important points we make in this study, and this was published in the journal um, in Health Services Research, and we say, look, data are great, but you're still going to need experts to be able to interpret those findings. And, and so if, even if you have data, you'll want to have some sort of governance body that would use those data to actually figure out which states and specialties you should target graduate medical education to. So if you're interested in that, that study, you can pull that up in health services research. The second study that we're really excited about that I just presented at a National Academy of Medicine workshop about two weeks ago in early October was really trying to figure out what's happening in the states. There's been a lot of focus on graduate medical education at the national level, a lot of debate, a lot of really important policy discussion. But we believed that states were actually very interesting policy laboratories to look at what they were doing to really reform graduate medical education. And one of the things that we saw, which was the discussion of this National Academy of Medicine conference was states really want data. They really want measures and metrics that they can figure out where should we target our state funding. These state funds may be Medicaid funds or they may be state appropriations, but states are really trying to figure out, okay, we've got a, we've got a certain amount of money here and we have budget constraints and we want to use that money to, to get the highest return on investment. Where should we target it? What specialties, which areas, which settings? And so we really heard from states that they need, they need better data. We also heard from states that, as I mentioned in the earlier study, oversight bodies. And what do I mean by that? I mean states have actually convened groups of hospitals and community health centers and professions and states that have an AHEC and rural health and, and PCOs and others have come together to say, okay, if we have these data that say, you know, they're pointing towards shortage areas, where should we put, you know, let's agree on where we should put GME. But that oversight body actually plays an absolutely critical role in educating the legislature. Probably not surprisingly in your state, the legislators don't actually understand sometimes graduate medical education. And so you need a body that can really educate the legislature about the importance of graduate medical education to shaping the physician workforce in that state. And frankly, as you know, and anyone in GME knows, there are a lot of competing interests in this space. And so you need a body that can sort of help navigate those. We also heard from states a real call for increased accountability and transparency. States said, look, we want to know where are we spending our graduate medical education dollars? Where are they going? What are they buying? And so this study is really not, it's not data driven, it's a, it's a qualitative study. And so I want to emphasize that one of the things I love about this study is it literally gives voice to the critical enablers and challenges to GME reform. A third study uh, that we have completed, which is really actually what we're calling an app, it's a, it's a data visualization, and this is the DocFlows app. And you'll see the URL at the bottom of the screen. And, and, and remember that I just said states are sort of yearning for good data, and the feds are as well. How do they, how do they know how many residents have left their state and, and where have they gone? And this app actually gives you the ability to query and download data and share maps that actually show where did your residents in internal medicine go? Where did your residents in family medicine go? Or of your existing physician workforce, where are you pulling from? What other states are you pulling from? We felt it was very important to share these data with states. States need to know, for example, by specialty, where their residents are ending up and, and, the, and the percent that they're retaining. And so this tool really gives them those data that they're actively seeking. 
We also know that the federal government and, and federal agencies such as HRSA, the Council on Graduate Medical Education, MedPAC, the ACGME, professional associations, and others are really yearning for these sorts of data. So we'll hope that after this webinar you have a chance to play with those data. And if you have any comments or suggestions, please feel free to send them back to me. The fourth study is a really important study. I think sometimes we really underestimate the degree to which residents will start in one specialty and they'll change specialties. In fact, I was just talking to a, a resident this morning who started in surgery and has switched over to preventive medicine. And we typically don't think about that. And so this study was an effort to really understand the magnitude, the degree to which residents were changing specialties and the timing of when they chose it. And why is this important? We felt that policymakers at both the state and federal level needed to understand that just because you put this many internal medicine slots in, you're not going to get that many general internists out the other end. You're going to get this many endocrinologists and this many cardiologists, et cetera. And so we wanted to be able to give them the ability to have a tool that they could use to say, okay, if I put this many slots in this specialty, how many of them will end up in those shortage specialties that I'm trying to target? And how many of them will end up in some of those subspecialties that in fact are not in shortage and I'm not targeting? So we wanted to be able to give people those data. Fifth and sixth studies are studies that are sort of paired together. This fifth study is, a, is, a, is some work that we're doing trying to create a toolkit for state policymakers. And that toolkit will describe data sources and variables and methodologies that states can actually use to assess different workforce outcomes. So the outcomes that will enable, will give states the ability to measure our specialty choice and whether the resident went on to practice in a rural versus an urban location, whether they're in a HIPSA and whether they're participating in Medicaid. And we really feel like, as I mentioned, this will give states literally the tools and data that they need to measure accountability. And the last study that I want to talk about is, an, is a study that we're doing looking at the outcomes of pediatric residency training programs in the United States. We really wanted to look at, say, of the 220 pediatric residency training programs in the United States, how, where are those residents going? And so this work really builds an important seminal work done by Candace Chen and some of her colleagues methodology builds on their methodology, but ours is a cohort analysis, and I'll explain in a second what I mean by that, that looks at both the program level, so the residency program level, but also at the institutional level. So that, say here at UNC, I could, I could look at UNC Chapel Hill's outcomes, but I could look at UNC Chapel Hill Family Medicine, UNC Chapel Hill Surgery, et cetera. So we're asking basically of that 2011 cohort of pediatric residents, where are they in 2016? The percent that remained in the state in which they trained, the percent in rural areas, HIPSAs, those that stayed in general pediatrics, and those that are accepting Medicaid patients. And ultimately, those, all of those workforce outcomes for those 220 pediatric, about 220 pediatric residency training programs will be put into a dashboard and, and in a data visualization that will really allow training uh, comparisons of different training programs that we think people will actually benefit from and use. So in summary, I just want to sort of point out our center, our Carolina Health Workforce Research Center. We really are using our work. This has been a talk about GME. We're doing lots of other sorts of work, but we really aim to produce research to affect and shape health workforce policy. And we're hugely grateful to the National Center for Health Workforce Analysis within HRSA and DHHS for affording us the ability to do that. We're really working on developing some new methods and tools, and you've seen that. We're trying to build the science through manuscripts, policy briefs, and other venues. But, but also, those of you who know me know I'm absolutely committed to mentoring the next generation of health workforce researchers. And we've actually mentored 11 students who've worked with our center over the last four and a half years. And I hope to continue to build that future generation of health workforce researchers. So please reach out to us if you have any questions. We look forward to hearing from you. If you play with the tools and have any comments, any other suggestions, thanks so much. Thank you, Erin. That was a great presentation, just really highlighting the, the breadth of what you were able to accomplish through the Health Workforce Research Center funding just in one topic area. And I really like the slide that you had at the end to show your, your impact that your center has had, but collectively, the six centers have had just a tremendous impact along those lines as well. As part of the preparation for an earlier meeting that sort of led to the development of these, these two webinar presentations, we realized we really want to focus on dissemination because collectively, the, center, the centers have conducted over close to 80 research studies in the first four years published manuscripts in 12 different journals, 
One article was selected as a, that was featured in last session was selected as an editor's pick by Health Affairs. So there's a really a lot of great work that's being done. Over 24 students across the centers have been mentored and for participated in some of the research studies. And we've had presentations at Academy Health and other major pre conferences, um, including two that were selected for best abstracts in, in the workforce theme. So it's exciting to see so much of this um, emerging as part of our studies. Now I'd like to turn to our last formal presenter before we open it up for q and I don't see any questions in the, uh, for Aaron, clarifying questions for Aaron in the chat box. And for our last presentation today, we'll have a, we'll hear from Susan Chapman, who's the Deputy Director of the UCSF Long-Term Care Health Workforce Research Center. And she's going to be sharing some of their findings related to the long-term care workforce. Hello, my name is Susan Chapman. I'm at the Long-Term Care Workforce Center at University of California, San Francisco, and I'm presenting for myself and Joanne Spetz. I'm going to talk today about the long-term care workforce for a growing aged population. It probably isn't news to anyone that we have a looming long-term care crisis. Clearly our census data show that by 2030 we will have more than 7 million people who are 65 years and older. Every year the number of people moving into that category grows. We expect that to be 20% of the population in the coming decades, so not too long from now. Looking at the workforce needs by 2050, it looks like the need, those number that need long-term care, the population will more than double. So we're talking about 19 million people in 2050 who will need long-term care. Who will care for those who need long-term care? This isn't just our aging population, but that's what I'm gonna focus on today. An IOM report from 2008 projected that we need 3.5 million additional workers by 2030. So that's coming up soon. I'm gonna talk about a couple of studies we did briefly to, to show the kind of work that our workforce center does. This first one was demand modeling, demand and supply modeling. So it's a data heavy pro project. And we really looked, starting at the bottom here, what, what does the literature say about long-term care and are there models out there that project the kinds of workers we will need as well as the setting? And we found basically that there aren't any good recent models that have been updated. So we, we put together our own study looking at four types of long-term care services, including care at home, care in nursing homes, care in adult health, and then well, how would that population increase as we look at projections in the future? And then how would the workforce increase using those data? So we also looked at, you know, are changing demographics in the, in the country going to change that need? We know that people from different races and ethnicities and as well as gender might change the dynamics of long-term care demand. So our punchline is there at the top. Our, our final conclusion is that at the end of this, no matter how you change the, the composition of the demographics, this does not change our workforce needs. A little bit more about this study. We, and this speaks to the kind of data sets available to do these kinds of projections. As I said, we did not find a study where this was already completed. But we looked at a number of, of kinds of data sets. The National Health and Aging Trends Survey, which is called NHATS, and we chose some data from 2011. This was a report we did in 2015. So as you can see, there's always a data lag in, in these kinds of studies. We also looked at what's called MEPS, the Medical Expenditure Panel Survey, and the Home Health Services section to get a ratio of users to population. We looked at the National Study of Long-Term Care Providers from 2013 to look specifically at adult daycare center clients in the population. And then of course using census data to look at population estimates. To look at the workforce, the data are a little bit more limited in terms of their accuracy for specific settings of care. But we looked at, used, basically used the Bureau of Labor Statistics and looked at all of the types of people who work in long-term care, home care aides, nurses, et cetera. So looking at those data, this next slide 
we look at the projected job growth from 2010 to 2030. And as you can see here, pretty much on that last column, all of them are pretty high growth rates in those two decades. That includes, and then we have the number of jobs projected by those data. And, and this is everyone in long-term care, the professionals from RNs, LPNs, social workers, occupations such as nursing assistants, certified nursing assistants, home health aides, and personal care aides, HHA, PCA, as well as the folks who do food prep and serving and office and administrative support, support buildings and ground maintenance, as well as, as management. So all of these jobs in long-term care will be growing in the coming decades. That's one type of study where one would look at, you know, how do we project the workforce demand in the future? The second study was looking at those PCAs, those personal care aides, and the training standards and what kind of training is, is required. These workers are also sometimes called home care workers. An important distinction is that these are different than home health workers. Home health workers provide intermittent health care. Home care workers provide more supportive services, such as support for activities of daily living, bathing, dressing, transferring, et cetera. In partnership with PHI, we research the regulations in all 50 states regarding training requirements for PCAs. First, let me say that on the federal level, there are no training requirements for these positions. How we did this search was looking at state administrative codes, we looked at licensing laws, all the Medicaid provider manuals, manuals from the Medicaid waiver documents. And then we did some qualitative, that the investigators on the study rated each state along a number of factors, including, you know, what is the curriculum, how rigorous is it, how many hours, how uniform is the training across states. Kind of our bottom line finding in that is that we found seven leader states. That was one of our goals to kind of identify states that seem to be ahead in this process. So we found seven states that we said had both consistency and rigor in their training. The next piece we did is to sort of consolidate our findings on this. What do we know about PCA training? Well, we found that 11 states, that's 23% of our states, have no, no formal training requirements for PCA. 18 states, 35% did specify training hours. However, when we look at the amount of training, it was limited. Only five states had more than 40 hours of training. There were seven states that required that PCAs complete some other kind of certification, such as the, the certified nurse assistant. And we also found that 19 states have uniform training requirements across programs. And what I mean by that is across programs that use PCAs, such as for persons with a disability, persons with a developmental disability, persons with a mental health disability, et cetera. So that was the good news on that. However, only four states specified what kind of curriculum PCAs needed to have. So that gets to, you know, what kind of competencies are we talking about and, and what's important there. So what are our long-term care policy findings overall? What are some of the workforce focus areas? One of the things we're looking at is scope of practice, which really, scope of practice can be limiting factor in terms of who does what, who supervises what, what can be done independently, as well as what's the supply, um, where, do, where are the supply limited because of scope of practice. We also look at state and federal requirements. We are seeing some movement towards specific requirements, such as dementia care. CMS, as well as the states, have started requiring very specific requirements of the health plans for dementia care. So that brings in a whole new realm of, of training and specialists. Workforce sustainability is another issue across the long-term care workforce. Many of the entry-level workers uh, have very low wages, live in poverty, do not have health care benefits themselves, and lack career growth opportunities. This has implications for quality of care delivered as, as well as turnover. And then, of course, looking at funding models and payment 
such as how are we looking at reimbursement issues for complex care, care coordination, the kinds of things that haven't been reimbursed separately before, how can we look at how those changes improve or, or assist care coordination and provide incentives for such. In the face of this, we're also looking at budget threats to long-term care supports and services from the federal and state level. So that's a summary of a couple of studies that our center is doing and some of the big picture workforce policy issues in long-term care. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Susan. It's really great to see so much attention and, and analysis directed towards understanding our long-term care workforce needs too. And generally seeing so many of federal data sets that are, that are out there being mined um, for that purpose, just like we saw earlier with Bianca's presentation. So speaking of Bianca, I guess I'll not, I don't see any clarifying questions in the chat box or actually any questions for our panelists in the chat box yet, but as a reminder, if you do have a question, please post it in there and um, direct it towards all panelists so we can see the questions as they come through. But I'll go ahead and get the conversation started and I'll, I'll direct my first question to you, Bianca. I was really struck in the research that um, you presented in the, you just made a comment at the end, but I remember this from earlier when we were talking about how many of the jobs that are growing and, and um, that you we were focused on, the people are living in high poverty and have a high reliance on Medicaid and other public benefits. And I, I was just wondering, like, how can we get our, do you have any thoughts on how we can get our policy leaders engaged in solving some of those issues and challenges for our, our low skill, um, low wage workforce? Thank you, Cleese. I appreciate the question. Yes, so you're right. We have another study that we conducted through uh, our HRSA funding to look at the socioeconomic status of our healthcare workers. Um, as we know, many times when we talk about the health workforce or healthcare generally, we talk about providing care to those who are underserved. But I think what is less understood or known is that our healthcare workers themselves are a, a population that are struggling with uh, socioeconomic uh, challenges, including things like poverty and being uninsured. And it's slowly getting on the radar in a larger national conversation. I'm starting to see more reporters discuss uh, the challenges that long-term care workers in particular are facing, especially with a focus on home care aid. This is an area that labor unions such as SEIU in particular has been really keen on protecting home care aides because they play a critical role in caring for our elderly. And so there has been advocacy work in local areas to increase the minimum wage for these workers. And so here in Washington State, for example, I think it's starting in January of 2018, home care aides will receive a $15 minimum wage increase. and these kinds of activities or advocacy activities are happening across the country. In addition, so if someone is part of a labor union, they may receive some health insurance, so that provides some support and stability financially. But we are currently conducting a small pilot study here uh, at UW to look at whether the expansion of Medicaid and the availability of health insurance through the exchanges is helping at all in terms of receiving health insurance coverage among our low-skilled long-term care workers. So we'll see hopefully in about a year whether we're seeing any indications that these reforms from the Affordable Care Act is helping anybody, helping anybody um, feel somewhat more stable in these jobs. It will probably become more of a conversation, I'm hoping, in the coming years as baby boomers uh, age and they try to find the care they need in the home and can't find it because that will then bring attention to this uh, issue in terms of the need to support our healthcare workers and provide them the financial stability they need. Uh, but it, it still will probably take some time and more research to understand exactly how much these financial challenges are affecting people's uh, interest in working in these jobs. Thanks, Bianca. 
Erin, what about you? Are you getting, uh, Bianca expressed some optimism that maybe policy leaders can get, be more engaged. Are you equally optimistic that accountability and metrics and other of the challenges and data needs you pointed out that states were looking for will be adopted? Thanks, please, for the question. I guess I would say at the federal level, um, I'm cautiously optimistic. There was great energy at the National Academy of Medicine meeting that I mentioned at the beginning of October around the need to really develop metrics and increase transparency and accountability. But for those of you who've been watching uh, the evolution of the GME debate at the national level, there are many interests at stake here. And um, I think actually the states are more likely to implement accountability than the feds. And my reason is that states are really facing a lot of economic pressures. And so both with their Medicaid dollars and with their state appropriations, as I mentioned in those slides, they really are looking for ways to increase the return on investment. And the only way to do that is to know where those dollars are going and what they're getting for them. So I am optimistic at the state level that there will be action. There is, in fact, some action already in some states. Um, and, and one can hope that as in this great federalist society in which we live, that those lessons learned from the states may trickle up to the feds as the feds continue to debate this issue. Right. Thanks, Erin. And I, I guess I, I'd ask a follow-up question. Do you think once people have some of that data that, are you optimistic they could make good use of it, that they would have really the rich source of information they could use to make good policy decisions? I think currently they don't have the data that they need. And I am optimistic that armed with the data, they will make better decisions. I think we see, for example, in our own state here in North Carolina, um, that when we put out data uh, and provide information to people, they do actually use it. Legislators, the policy, you know, in, in DHHS and other places do actually use the data for informed workforce policy decisions. I think the onus is on us as health workforce researchers to make sure that we get the data and the research into a format that is actually useful. And that's why our center is spending so much time creating data visualizations, creating two-page policy briefs, doing a lot with maps. So I think that you've hit on a really important question, Cleese, is not just producing the data, but producing it in a format that is useful and will actually motivate change. And in sometimes I say actually agitate for change. Um, and I think we can be data agitators if we actually produce information that can help shape and change the narrative. So I guess another question I have for you and Bianca, is, do you see challenges mitigating in rural areas? And, and as an aside, I'm, I think we're having some difficulty with having uh, Susan Chapman join or I would direct a question to her. And do you see a do you, Aaron, do you and Bianca see a challenge in having access to health professionals in rural communities? Is that something you've been able to shine a light on in your work? Bianca, do you want to lead? Uh, sure, sure. Sorry, I'm also trying to get myself on mute. So I, I would say that uh, our health workforce, uh, especially in the lower skilled jobs, has a real opportunity to uh, fill in some roles in rural communities. We we do know, at least here in Washington State, in a survey that we did recently on medical assistants, that the medical assistants are being hired where certain communities are not able to hire on a registered nurse. So they do fill roles uh, where we see shortages. Uh, and these, many of these workers in the aid and assistant position, they are, as I mentioned earlier, kind of in a lower skilled opportunity, but they tend to be younger and maybe actually more likely trained and um, maybe even grew up in their local community. So they're interested in staying locally and so this is great in terms of seeing people give back to their community by becoming a medical assistant or a home health aide in their local community to support them. My concern is just whether there are real career opportunities to help them move forward. So what does that look like? What does 
what does staying in a community look like for some of these workers? If they want to get a higher degree, do they have to go elsewhere? Or do they really even need a higher degree to move up in a career? Uh, and those are the kinds of questions we're trying to understand better uh, here at University of Washington. Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> I wasn't sure I was on. I wanted to, I can respond to that question. And then I wanted to go back to an earlier question also. Um, sorry, I'm, I'm late. The issue about, you know, low paid workers and the sustainability, sustainability issues. Um, I think there are some, um, there's some sort of overall uh, social issues there as well as market issues and policy issues. The social issues are really about value and how people, what kind of work is valued, which is to, to me speaks to sort of doing some multidisciplinary work about, about value and the, and the value of care. Uh, because I think this care is not highly valued and, and therefore, but you know, given the demand and the need, how do we kind of change that paradigm? The other thing I think is, um, you know, the market may, as demand increases, uh, some employers, I think, are seeing the value of a little bit higher pay to address issues like, you know, turnover and onboarding and bringing on the highest quality people. So it could be that some of those market forces will address uh, some of the pay issues, particularly certainly in the in the private pay market where there's an opportunity, but, but even in the um, sort of, um, you know, public payer model where as models reform, we see more opportunity to, you know, put more, put more money into the, um, the sort of the entry level work because we can't afford to, um, because we need people to do practice at, at their uh, top of their license and scope. In terms of the rural areas, what, what I've learned over, over time is that the, the rural, and I'm sure others can verify this, that in rural settings, it's almost a whole different model of care where people do what's needed to do and, and issues like boundaries and scope sometimes, you know, get put in the background versus who needs to do what. So I think there are a lot of opportunities. One of the missing pieces is often the educational component where we don't have the opportunities to, um, for career growth and, and education without people leaving the, the rural uh, area. and distance education has done some of this, but I think how we distribute education is a big issue still on the table. Susan, uh, Aaron, I'll get to you on the rural issue, but I, I, I want to follow up with you on a comment that I, I thought you triggered with me about um, engaging the public and getting and calling for change in, in, in the home health aid. I was at a presentation recently where they were talking about how um, anytime they present on the home health aid workforce, someone in the audience always comes up with a personal story about how they felt like it wasn't meeting their needs and that the workforce turned over a lot. And, and I wonder if there's a way we can, we collectively in the, in the research community can do a better job in making sure that our research gets out to the public community so that they, and we engage them and help them use their voice to help amplify our work. I don't know if that's something that you've been thinking about. Uh, thought about it. I mean, part of it is, you know, a lot of our research isn't, we don't turn those briefs into a public, uh, sort of a public audience document. So that's one way to think about it. I mean, I can't imagine the public, get, you know, sort of uh, being interested in, in the way that we present the data or, or what it says. So we kind of have to, to reframe it for a, for a public audience. And also, you know, anecdotes speak much more loudly than research does. And once people have poor experiences, um, that's kind of what sticks with them. So uh, are we going to engage that public with poor experiences as, as agents of change? Or, you know, how do we, uh, how do we kind of address those those um, those anecdotes and those and those experiences into positive change and I think that is um, goes beyond our research in, in ways of you know um, I'm, I'm thinking of nursing as a background you know so so image and and public relations and all kinds of and working with employers and those sorts of things that we tend not to think a lot about thank you um, Aaron 
Sure. So I, I think what you're asking us in the initial question was around rural issues and the degree to which mm -hmm. our center is actually engaged in that. And I, and I think this is near and dear to our center here. We're also uh, co-located with a, a Office of Rural Health Policy Rural Center, um, as UW is. And, and what we notice continuously is, is sort of a national narrative that focuses on increasing the overall supply of doctors, nurses, dentists, you name it. And what we've really been trying to do is to shift that narrative and to do it with data. So using modeling and using our GME work to say, you know what, maybe the issue is not an issue of overall supply and people love it. It gets newspaper attention. People love to yell about a shortage. But what we're trying to get people to, say, to realize is that these rural communities really are suffering and there really are access issues and really trying to shift the narrative more towards the maldistribution by geography the maldistribution by specialty, the lack of primary care, psychiatry, general surgery, and the maldistribution by setting. And so these things are related, that we, uh, we live in a world that has traditionally focused on training health professionals in hospitals. Increasingly, we need to be moving that outpatient. And so I sort of see, you know, I see, you know, um, uh, Casey Blumenthal from Montana, Linda Lacey from South Carolina, Mary Lou Burnell from, from um, South Carolina as well. And we're trying to really, you know, in your state as well, um, trying to sort of get people to realize it's not just an issue of overall supply, it's an issue of um, distribution. And to get to Su Susan's point is we are also trying to really get people to, sh to invest in uh, rural education. And in our, in our minds, in, in our work, a lot of that's around graduate medical education. And a lot of GME is focused in urban areas and trying to sort of disseminate that um, and, and move that out to rural communities. So that's sort of where our work has been, um, trying to use data to shift the narrative and really trying to use it to, to get people to invest in GME and, and rural outpatient and primary care and other shortage specialties. You happened to mention uh, Linda Lacey's name, and she actually just typed in a comment, um, which she said was following up to your idea of uh, the idea of bringing in the public. And she said, in South Carolina, we send out press releases to TV and newspaper media organizations to alert the public to our research findings, and they often get picked up and turned into short news stories or TV spots. So it seems like there is maybe some potential there for um, thinking about that a little bit more. I know it's not something an audience that I've typically thought about is. Uh, targeting some of the work that I've been involved in towards, but perhaps they can be a, a champion for some of the other studies that we've been doing if we direct our attention that way. Um, and we have about five minutes left in our, or maybe eight, eight minutes left in our time. I guess what I might um, go to next, if there aren't any more comments or questions in the chat, is to um, have you sort of tee up some of the work that you're doing now and what we might be look, look forward to hearing about or reading about in peer review journals or Maybe even seeing something on in TV and newspaper media outlets if we can do if we can get to the public side of things um, that that you'd like to maybe highlight for the audience. And beyond, we'll go in order of presentation. Bianca, do you want to start? Sure, sure. And just on that point about trying to get uh, information out and how to communicate it, it's always an ongoing challenge of trying to figure out how to. Uh, get our work out to the right audience and uh, trying to distill it to the easiest short messages is best. And I find that the best way to really understand what people need is to try to commute our, communicate our findings to a group, and uh, including reporters in particular who are trying to distill, like, what's that final message? Uh, it really actually helps us uh, think about how we approach our own questions. Uh, and just on that note, recently we uh, did uh, get picked up through Politico uh, in a discussion around immigrants and DACA, and uh, the reporter wanted to understand how DACA would potentially impact the workforce, uh, the healthcare workforce, and uh, he did a nice uh, spread on um, on the role of uh, immigrants in home care uh, aid jobs. So I do recommend that you check that out because that's based on a lot of the work that we're, we've been doing here at the center. Um, other work that's coming is uh, we're looking at commuting patterns of our healthcare workers to understand to what extent uh, workers are leaving their uh, local communities to find work uh, further away in order to find higher wages. Uh, our concern is whether uh, that type of, whether commuting might be potentially um, 
might be potentially impacting the local community by drawing workers away in communities where they might actually need them. So we're just trying to get a sense of to what extent that might be happening. Uh, we have, a, I alluded to briefly, a survey about medical assistance here in Washington State, which is the, the only state that's certifying medical assistance to understand what the role of certification um, does in terms of the kinds of activities medical assistants are being asked to do. Uh, I think what's really mostly interesting uh, in, in some of these, uh, in this study is uh, actually some of the open-ended questions uh, where there's a clear sense among medical assistants that uh, they are doing the work of uh, registered nurses but not being paid adequately. So uh, it will probably actually lead to more uh, studies to understand what's happening there. Um, uh, other studies is that we're, we've been having a three-part series now um, on trying to understand the value of public data and trying to understand what can one get out of um, data sources like the American Community Survey, Current Population Survey, et cetera, mm -hmm. and how different the stories might be from those different data sources. So those, those are just a couple of snippets um, of the types of studies we're doing. Um, I strongly encourage folks to come and visit our website, uh, follow us on Twitter at UWChoose um, to see more about the kinds of work that we're doing. Thanks, Bianca. And um, Erin, do you want to queue up some of your things that are in the pipeline? Sure. A quick overview of uh, new adventures at the Carolina Health Workforce Research Center. Um, mm -hmm. Like the University of Washington, we are uh, completing a, a study of medical assistance evolving roles in primary care settings. Uh, predominantly looking at two things. One, uh, workforce development needs. The uh, seminal work done by Susan Chapman uh, around mm -hmm. sort of the heterogeneity in, in training for MAs makes uh, it difficult for practices to really understand what MAs can and cannot do safely. So we're actually looking at that through our survey. And we're also doing a really neat thing where we've actually asked physicians, primary care physicians, what would you delegate uh, if, you, if you could and you're not currently delegating, and, and where do you think MAs need more um, training? So it's sort of a, a neat a view on MAs, both from the MAs themselves, but also their supervising physicians. We're doing some work, um, for those of you interested in the nursing workforce, we're very invested in looking at uh, licensed practical nurse to registered nurse transitions. Um, using uh, sociological theory, life course theory, to really understand the timing of those transitions and factors that influence an LPN deciding to go on and become an RN. I mentioned our two studies, that one will give states a toolkit and data to be able to understand sort of how they evaluate the return on investment um, for their dollars invested in graduate medical education, and then a second study looking at the outcomes of pediatric residency uh, programs. The last study I just want to highlight is, is one that I'm really excited about. We, our center is very interested in understanding the role of electronic health records and the data that are housed in the electronic health record. It's a veritable gold mine. Now, how you extract that information around sort of workforce roles is something our center is trying to figure out how to do. For example, our study is going to look at the degree to which you can understand social work functions and interventions using EHRs. We hope to then extend that in the future to say how could we better utilize EHRs for workforce research and planning. So those are some of the things going on at our center. Thanks, Erin. And Susan, you want to highlight a couple of things in our, in our last couple of minutes here? Sorry, I have to get off mute first. Um, I'll be quick. Um, a couple of them I'll just sort of talk about briefly. These are all still in the long-term care arena. One, we are looking at the role of social workers in long-term care. Um, and it's it's kind of a, you know, where where are the data, what do they say, and then how do we sort of suss out uh, what those roles are and how they interface with other roles. Um, and so we'll be also looking at, um, you know, what the, what the education component is producing as well. Another kind of special role we're looking at is geriatricians, you know, specially trained uh, uh, physicians in geriatrics are a very uh, shrinking and small number of people, and so we're trying to uh, look at uh, what they do and where they work, and are they consultants, are they seeing patients, how do systems use them, how are they employed, et cetera. 
Um, and the third one is uh, we have done a couple of reports and are continuing to look at dementia care and the competencies and capabilities required for dementia care. This is something that has come down from CMS and contracts, et cetera, requiring capabilities and competencies, but not being very clear on what those are. So we're on our actually fourth project um, looking at various ways of, of looking at that. The one that's really uh, interesting to me is um, we're, we're taking a look at long-term care technology which is a huge uh, field and actually economic opportunity. I, I went to a sort of a tech conference on long-term care, care technology and there's all sorts of stuff and products out there. Our piece is gonna be on what, how does that impact the workforce? Are we talking about things that assist the workforce, that potentially replace the workforce, that help with workforce communications, that perhaps help with workforce um, satisfaction and retention? So we're gonna do, we're sort of in major data collection mode, look at everything that's out there. Then we're gonna do a kind of a systematic um, taxonomy uh, categorization of what's out there and critically review that and then follow up with some interviews at some of the uh, products, services, programs that have a direct impact on the workforce. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Erin and Bianca for your presentation. And thank you to the Albany Health Workforce Research Center Technical Assistance Group for hosting this event. I hope that we continue to have more of these in the future and that we can learn about the, the findings from the exciting work that was just mentioned today during this call at the end. And if you want more information about any of the studies, um, there was a report summarizing a lot of these findings that we prepared for the May 3rd meeting that sort of led to this further dissemination webinar. And that can be found at um, gwhwi.org. And it also includes links to all of the Health Workforce Research Centers so you can learn more about their, on, their past work and their ongoing work for the future. And with that, I wanna um, wrap up two minutes late, sorry, but I um, appreciate everyone's involvement in the questions and comments we got and um, look forward to our next seminar. Thanks, bye-bye.